Let's go. <clears throat> if you need, you can set up some more of those chairs, perhaps on the side or in the back. If we could uh, start settling down, we could start the uh, the discussion. I think a few more people are coming in. Are they? There's some seats over here in front. If you feel more comfortable, you can take some seats from the back, set them up. Uh, my name is Joe Lombardo. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. I'm also the coordinator of a national anti-war coalition called UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. Um, you can find us online and other places. Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace uh, this year is celebrating our 20th year of being in existence. We started right before the invasion of Iraq. Uh, a few people got together and met and decided to form an organization, <coughs> Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We started weekly vigils and we've been holding weekly vigils on Monday night from five to six ever since. Um, in the winter lately, we've been doing them from four to five because it gets dark early. Um, the two next vigils are themed vigils. Generally, they're just anti-war vigils. The two next ones are going to be themed vigils. On Monday, January 9th, from 4 to 5, we'll be um, vigiling with the theme of closing Guantanamo, um, which, as you know, is a piece of Cuba, which we have refused to give back to Cuba and keep it as a military base and a prison and a black site where torture has happened um, and where most of the people who were there were never charged with anything. There are still people there years after. The second uh, vigil will be January 16th and this will be part of the call by the United National Anti-War Coalition for anti-war actions around the week of Martin Luther King. As you know, Martin Luther King, towards the end of his life, um, came out very strongly against the war in Vietnam. He gave a talk uh, in New York City at the Riverside Church. Uh, he was encouraged by others not to give it, to stick to civil rights and not to talk about um, the Vietnam War, but he said they are connected and he couldn't do that. And during that speech, he called um, the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And so the anti-war movement is using this week to not just celebrate Martin Luther King's life, but also to talk about his anti-war positions. And I urge you to join us um, on Monday the 16th and be part of actions that will take place all across the country. We did a similar thing right before the elections in October. We had actions in about 76 places around the country, and we're building up to that number again. Hopefully we'll, we'll match that number by uh, next week. So I urge you to join us. Uh, today we're going to talk about Ukraine. Ukraine is really the center of world politics right now. It has brought us to a place where major powers, the United States, NATO, Russia, major nuclear powers are confronting each other. And that brings the possibility of escalation, brings the possibility of nuclear war. Um, nuclear war is devastating for all of us, so it is something that we all need to try to avoid and figure out the best ways to bring peace 
um, uh, in the area. Um, I've been to Ukraine twice, personally. The last time was in uh, 19, uh, 2019. I'm not old enough to be 1919, <coughs> but I might look it. But 2019, um, we were there because UNAC, um, as it had been in the past and had gone in the past, had been invited by people from Odessa to come because in early May, they hold memorials for the people that were killed when a group of right-wingers attacked them and um, uh, chased people that were vigiling who were opposed to the 2014 coup in Ukraine into the House of Trade Unions. They were vigiling in front of that, in the square, in front of that building. Um, they were shot at, Molotov cocktails were thrown, the building was set with sort of light. Um, people jumped from the windows, they were beaten to death on the ground. Um, about 50, 40 and 48 is usually the number that's given. People were killed. A lot of the people that we spoke with who were there, who were there to um, memorialize those killed, uh, said it was likely over 50, but if it was 50, that brought in some international um, uh, observers and international inquiry into uh, what happened. They didn't want to do that. About 100 were wounded. Uh, the only people, even though you could see hundreds of videos of this, people shooting, building Molotov cocktails, throwing them, I was told the names of some of those people that did it. It's clear the authorities know the people that had a gun and were shooting <coughs> up there, but none of them were ever arrested. However, 30 of the survivors were arrested that night. Um, however, the next day, 30,000 people from Odessa mobilized, went to the police station, got them out, and, um, and they have been freed by the people. So uh, we were there to observe because, again, the right wing said they would be there. And the right wing was there. But we saw thousands and thousands of people march throughout the day and leave flowers at, at, the, house, at the House of Trade Unions for these people. At about 3 o'clock, when the families of those killed came there to speak, and there had been a, a sound system set up for them to speak, the police disconnected the sound system and would not let them speak. There were also gangs of people, some of them with swastikas on their side that were there to intimidate them. The police did not stop them from doing that. And that night, those people marched through um, uh, Odessa to the center of Odessa. They did have a sound system, torchlight um, uh, brigades, this patriotic music, hang the communists from the trees, they ch chanted and they were allowed to have their sound system. Um, so we were there and we saw some of that. Our first speaker, someone who has just toured Russia, uh, parts of Russia, and went to the Donbass to see and speak to people there. His name is Dan Kovalik. He's a graduate from Columbia Law School in 1993. He uh, currently teaches international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He's the author of seven books. Uh, he just recently um, addressed the UN Security Council on Ukraine, and um, he just came back from Donbass, as I as I, I mentioned. He's going to speak. Then Scott Ritter will speak, member of our own community. I'll, I'll introduce him, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. And. Um, this is a contentious issue. We all know that. So I urge everybody, you're going to hear positions you don't hear on the news. They will not put these positions on the corporate media. Um, uh, but uh, you will, we urge you to be respectful, to make your comments, st strong political comments, I'm all for it, um, but uh, make them in a respectful way, and we can have a respectful discussion. Um, this is something that we need to learn to do if we are going to stop 
violence and if we are going to stop war. So let's start it right here at this meeting for Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. So let me introduce you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Can everyone hear me in the back? And I want to wish to our Orthodox friends who are here a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Did you know you're celebrating? Um, I want to, oh, I, I should just say, my name's Dan Kavalik. My surname is actually Slovak. I'm not Russian, I'm Slovak. My, my grandfather emigrated here from Slovakia, Czechoslovakia at the time, to Cleveland in, uh, right after World War I. He was a baker. Anyway, I feel like I need to say that because a lot of people are accused of being Russian bots, but I'm Slovak. Uh, actually settled in Cleveland, Ohio, so I was raised a Cleveland Browns fan. That may be a more negative thing for some of you here. Uh, but I live in Pittsburgh now, and I'm a Steelers fan, which is probably even something more agitating uh, to some of you. But in any case, why are we here to speak today, the three of us here? Uh, we obviously, first of all, I was listening to a uh, podcast the other day, and the commentator said, what is the biggest question that I think we have to ask ourselves at this moment? And he answered the question, will we see, will humanity see the end of 2023? And that is why I'm sitting here today. I do not want a nuclear war with Russia. And I think that there are folks in Washington, sectors in Washington, that are willing to risk that. And I think we need to pull ourselves from that brink as we were pulled back from that brink during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And how were we pulled back from that brink? By negotiations. John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev negotiated a solution to that crisis in, I think, 13 days. At least that is the story. And it was done with a give and take. Khrushchev agreed to take the missiles out of Cuba, and, not, and uh, Kennedy agreed not to invade Cuba, and quietly and secretly agreed six months later he would take the missiles out of Turkey, which were a big thorn in the side of the Soviets, and that ended the Which may be a segue into how I think the U.S should be trying to deal with this crisis, and that is not through more military assistance. Uh, up to this date, once all that all that's been approved is sent, it'll be about $100 billion in military assistance to Ukraine. And Scott, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere that that exceeds the amount we spent on Vietnam, even adjusted for inflation. It's an incredible amount of money. And I don't know much about your town, I'm just visiting, but I can tell you in Pittsburgh, we have homeless on the streets, we have streets that are not functional, we have trash everywhere, we have a country that needs a little help, and a hundred billion dollars could go a long way. So I think this issue necessitates a full-throated discussion and debate about this issue which there's been none. None in Congress, none in the media. I will say that in my 54 years, I've never seen worse coverage of a conflict than I've seen on Ukraine. And one of the reasons we're here today is to at least give a bit of a balanced discussion about it. Because whether you like Russia or hate Russia or whatever, as John F. Kennedy understood, and as some of our better leaders understood, you've got to deal with a, a superpower that has nuclear weapons. You can't just ignore them, ignore their security concerns, and you have to see the world from how they see it. And I think that's a worthwhile thing to do. The other point I want to make, in terms of the $100 billion being sent, and you should know this as taxpayers if you don't know it, we don't even know where most of that money is going. According to the Washington Post, on November 1st, the White House could account for 10% of the weapons we had sent to Ukraine. 
The president of Nigeria has said he already knows some of those weapons have ended up in the hands of terrorists. So first of all, one asked a question, is the money going to where you think it's going? And when uh, some of the Congress people tried to audit that money, that was shut down, right? Why can't we at least have an audit? So that's another issue that I think needs to be discussed. And the other point that I want to make is what is the U.S.'s real goal in Ukraine? Does the U.S. care about Ukraine? Does it want to save Ukraine and Ukrainians? You hear people like Lindsey Graham saying that the Ukrainians will fight to the last, fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Well, is that what the Ukrainians really want? I think there are people in Washington that want that. I don't think that's good for Ukraine. So those are some of my at least initial thoughts because, as Joe pointed out, this is a very uh, emotional and fraught issue. But I think there are some maybe minimal issues, at least, that we could agree on, or at least agree to discuss. With that said, I do want to talk about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And I do want to talk about the fact that, contrary to what the media is saying now, but they did say it before, by the way, there was some coverage of this before, that this war has been going on for nine years not just since February. And I think that is important to recognize. And I think the media has failed, I fail isn't even, a, uh, doesn't capture it, has been disingenuous in pretending that that is not the case. And so I went to the Donetsk uh, Republic in November of, the, of last year, so well, a couple months ago to talk to people in Donetsk about what's been happening there since 2014. Now, if you don't know the, you know, Ukraine, uh, you have Donetsk and Luhansk, which are two oblasts, or now they're self-declared republics, in the eastern part of Ukraine that have been part of a conflict with the government in Kiev since 2014. Again, the media now tries to either pretend this isn't true or to just outright deny it. But you can find that the UN High Commission for Human Rights concluded that 14,000 people died in that conflict before Russia even intervened in February. And yet those 14,000 people have been forgotten. And when people say we should hear from Ukrainians, we should also hear from those people in the Donbass who have no voice in this country, let me tell you. None. And those people have been attacked by their own government for nine years. And to pretend that isn't true, to pretend this just happened in February out of the blue, is not true, is unfair to the people who've been part of that conflict, and frankly is not fair to the taxpayers of the U.S because it does not allow them to understand this conflict. And if you don't understand the conflict, you cannot find a way to end it in a way that, again, will avoid us from blowing each other up, which, again, in a minimal, I mean, at a minimum, I hope we can agree um, we want that. Uh, when I was in Donetsk, and maybe I'll, this is the time to show a few photos, if I might. First of all, this is the uh, Angel's Alley in Donetsk City. And this commemorates uh, the 160 children that were killed in Donetsk in 2014. And you can see the stuffed animals and toys that were laid there <coughs> to commemorate those deaths. Those are real people. Those are real children who died in a conflict, we're told, did not exist in 2014, but it did. And by the way, the U.S. has helped to arm that side of the conflict that was attacking these people and has, and again, the media pretends this isn't true, but I'm going to tell you there are neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and they have received, received training 
and aid from the United States. In fact, it was such a problem. And to prove my point, John Conyers, the former congressman, when he was a congressman from Detroit, introduced a bill that was signed by Congress and signed into law by Barack Obama saying it was illegal to fund Nazis in Ukraine. He didn't do it because there was no reason to pass that bill. He did it because it was a problem. And, but even more to the point, Congress then repealed that prohibition and Obama signed that into law. So not only was it a problem we were funding them, then they decided it was a problem we couldn't fund them. And yet the media, and I know there's members of the media here, will pretend that this Nazi problem doesn't exist. But it does. In any case. Okay. Uh, let me... Getting ahead of myself here. So the first couple pictures are actually taken in Russia. This was taken in the old Arbat Street in Russia, where I stayed. This is in Moscow. And this is a, uh, a nice tourist street. I mean, uh, Russians go there too, but it's a nice street. Tourist shops, restaurants. But on the street, you have this display of children who were killed in the Donbass in 2014. And again, here the Russians are honoring those children. Again, people will tell you those children don't exist, but they did exist. And they did die in the Donbass at the hands of the government uh, in Kiev. And again, in Russia, uh, they are commemorated. Now, the other photo that was taken in Russia and I'm sorry, I'm not real technologically savvy, was of this gentleman uh, who is from the Kharsan region of Ukraine and he now lives in Moscow. He started writing against what the Ukrainian government was doing in the Donbass after the massacre at the Odessa Trade Union house. Because he started writing against the government in Kiev and challenging them and dissenting, he was arrested. At that time, I think he was 79 years old. He's 82 now. He was arrested, put in jail for two and a half years, and tortured and he's, sh he's showing that they pulled his teeth out one at a time and left the roots so he would feel it. Kind of like Marathon Man, if you've ever seen that movie with Dustin Hoffman and Sir Lawrence Olivia. So he's showing me, he took his dentures out and showed me the remains of his teeth. So he went... Just click here, I think you'll get yeah. an arrow. Oh, so he moved uh, <coughs> to Russia. This here is a monument to the first president of the Donetsk People's Republic. So in 2014, after a coup, an unconstitutional coup that brought to power a right-wing government in Kiev and a government that was not friendly to the Russian-speaking population, the people in Donetsk voted to become an autonomous nation in the Donetsk People's Republic. This was the first president pictured here. He went to this cafe, it was a cafe, and he was killed. He was assassinated with a bomb that was put in a light bulb. And now this cafe is not a cafe anymore, it's just a memorial to him. But again, this was done in 2014. You get it at a time again when the world didn't seem to care what was happening in Ukraine. This is the Pushkin Theater, also in Donetsk City, very close to the cafe I just showed you. Okay, okay, thank you. Tell me I gotta be quick, and I will. I'll do my best. Um, 
This is in Danette City. This is the theater. You can see, if you look closely, it's all boarded up because there was a, fight, a fighter, uh, one of the leaders of the Donetsk militias, who was killed, I believe in August of 2022. It was a woman, actually. She's a very well-known fighter from there. She was killed. They tried to have a memorial service at this theater, and it was shelled, again, by Ukrainian forces. Uh, and that happened, I believe, in September of 2022. That's, that, that's the back of it. Here is just a cafe in Donetsk City. I, I mean, in, in part, I want to show you that, hey, you know, life goes on a bit during wartime. While I was there, you know, there were days it felt like a normal place, uh, but then, of course, it was shelled a few times while I was there, which I'll get to. This is a guy we call Grandpa, because he has seven grandchildren. You can see, his, I think he's 72. He's been fighting in 2014 to defend Donetsk against the Ukrainian forces. And he's still fighting. You can see he's quite an old man. Uh, but he volunteers for the Donetsk uh, militia. This is a school that was shelled uh, while we were there. And they went very quickly, as you see at night, to try to start uh, uh, fixing it. Uh, I'll get back to her in a second. This woman, and I'll get back to that school in a second. This woman wrote a book, as you can see here in the number 90, about her 90 days in captivity by the Azov, the fascist Azov battalion, who took over the airport in Mariupol, and she was tortured for 90 days. Her son was also held captive, and she talked about that with us, and that's the book she wrote about her captivity. This is the Lenin statue at Lenin Square, which still stands. And what's the significance of this? Uh, in 2014, the conflict in Donetsk really erupted when right-wing people came to try to take down the statue of Lenin and others came to defend it. Um, and you can see the people who defended it won because uh, it's still there. This is a park in Donetsk City on the uh, river. Again, I'm just showing it to show that life goes on. I mean, honestly, and I'm not being hyperbolic, <coughs> this city was cleaner than my city of Pittsburgh. People were out raking, sweeping up. Even during a war, they're trying to keep a life going, which is pretty amazing. Oh, uh, that was my hotel. That had been a uh, received shrapnel from, from a shelling uh, from Ukraine sometime before. This is just nightlife there in Donetsk. This is a World War II memorial in Donetsk City. I think it's important also to put a historical analysis on what people have gone through in places like Donetsk. During World War II, the Nazis occupied Donetsk. They had a concentration camp in Donetsk. And actually, and I didn't know this until I went to Donetsk, Donetsk, Donetsk is the site of the second largest mass grave of the Nazis during World War II. They threw 75,000 bodies into a mass grave, some of them alive. And of course, for these people, that was yesterday, right? They have grandparents who lived through that. Uh, and I think that's very much on the minds of people, which it should be. And by the way, the government of, of Ukraine is trying to take it down, monuments like this. So in front of that monument, there was a new monument put up to that female militia leader I mentioned. We were a little afraid maybe we'd be shelled, uh, but we weren't, thankfully. Uh, this tree is a place where people put red ribbons to mark the deaths of people who died during the conflict since 2014. This is a theater in Mariupol, also in the Donetsk People's Republic. You may know Mariupol from the summer. It made news because it's where the steel factory was that the Azov, the Nazi Azov Battalion, was hunkered down in and uh, was surrounded by Russian and Donetsk militia forces. And finally, after very a number of days, a number of weeks of hard battle, they were flushed out of there. Um, that's Mariupol. This is a theater there which was bombed from the inside, they believe, uh, by forces loyal um, to Ukraine. There were women and children in it at the time, but I don't think any died. It is now being reconstructed by, the Rush, by Russia, is the truth of it. This is the Alexander Nevsky Park. 
uh, you can see there's all this construction being done now in Mariupol, again, by the Russians, um, which I just point out to say that the Russians don't hate the Ukrainians. You know, we're, we're, it's portrayed that they do, but they, they, re they really don't. The, uh, and the folks in Donetsk, honestly, appreciate uh, what's, what they're doing. They're planting trees here in this park as well. Russians also built this uh, hospital, state-of-the-art hospital, in three and a half months after, after the September referendum in which people in Donetsk <coughs> voted to join Russia. That's just been built in the last few months, this hospital. This is a housing complex the Russians are also building to replace housing that was destroyed during the conflict. It's, it's going to house about 4,000 people. You can see it has some workout places and some um, playgrounds uh, for the kids as well. Here's just some graves to show you. These are people who died from the Donetsk militia mostly in 2014 to 2015. Again, for those who were led to believe that this war didn't exist until recently, that is not true. Another such monument. Uh, this is a World War II monument, also in the ne Donetsk People's Republic. It's also the site of a battle, actually, uh, between uh, Ukrainians who were trying to invade the Donetsk with tanks and Poles also 2014 there was there were Polish fighters as well and uh, that happened at this area a family there I asked if I could get a photo with them there um, and this is part of the World War II monument a shell um, that he located there that came from the battle probably in 2014 this guy's name Igor he's an interesting guy he's not from Donetsk He's from Odessa, but he moved to Donetsk to fight with the Donetsk People's Republic during the conflict beginning in 2014. He was captured for a while, he spent four years in captivity at the hands of the Azov Battalion, he was tortured for four years and lived to tell about it. Okay, uh, this guy was part of this battle that happened at this um, at this um, monument, and, and this young woman was our translator, Olga. Nice young woman. Uh, that's the monument. As you see, it was a World War II monument only, but now you can see 2014 to 2022. It now memorializes people who've been killed since 2014. These are seven of his comrades, the older guy I showed you, who died in the uh, fighting at this monument. You can see that this World War II monument was shelled by the Ukrainian forces. Again, Ukraine's trying to wipe out uh, a lot of these Soviet-era World War II uh, monuments. He was explaining that to us, Igor from Odessa, as I mentioned to you. This is uh, some more photos of Angel's Alley. This is a soccer stadium that was shelled while we were there, again by Ukraine. And this guy, if I can get the sound, is going to explain something. And maybe I'll leave it at this again if I can get if I can get the volume up. It was working before. Here we go. This is at the school. Of the shell. Uh, yeah, it's quite uh, right now. I know it's M uh, five hundred and forty nine. It's uh, American uh, shell. Yes, NATO. 155 meters. It's bottom. It's bottom of the shell. Yeah. See the size of the shell. It's have uh, so big uh, copper uh, part of copper. Uh, only this kind of shells have this. Bit. And here it was a rocket uh, engine. It's shell uh, that have some uh, rocket engine. And it's bottom. It's never broken apart. The little parts. It's all, always uh, you have always this big part. It's bottom of the shell. Yes, okay. And that was a school shelled while we were there again. That's your American taxpayer dollars of work shelling schools in the Donbass. He also explains the same thing here. Uh, I'm trying to go a little quicker. Um, they were planting trees this day. They had a little, little festival to plant trees here in Donetsk City while we were there. This guy's ex talking about a monastery that's being shelled by Ukraine almost daily. 
The monks now live underground because the monastery has been largely destroyed, again, with your tax dollars. And we actually brought clothes, in addition to going there to report, we brought clothes uh, for the monks. That was one thing we do. We, did. we brought a lot of clothes uh, for the monks living there. I was not allowed to go to that monastery because it, they said it was too dangerous. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll have questions after. Uh, okay. I hope to make it quicker so that uh, we will have time for discussion <laughs> and, and questions. Um, our, Next speaker is um, Scott Ritter. Uh, Scott, uh, as many of you know, comes from Bethlehem, comes from this community. He is um, uh, a longtime friend of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. Uh, during the Iraq War, he was um, uh, an inspector, chief inspector, UN chief inspector, in Iraq mm -hmm. looking for weapons of mass destruction, uh, which was the excuse for the war we conducted against the people of Iraq. Um, he had reported what he saw, that he didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. That was not the narrative the United States wanted you to hear, um, and so he became on the outs with the United States government at that point. Before that, he was in Russia because he was an inspector inspecting, ensuring that Russia kept to its side of the nuclear um, uh, arms agreements to not have nuclear weapons. Um, and during that period, he perhaps learned how important these arms agreements, especially these nuclear arms agreements, uh, are. The United States recently withdrew from the intermediate unilaterally um, nuclear arms um, agreement. But Scott, in his recent book, I think he's the author of nine books, um, in his recent book, which are in the back and you can get it, and Scott will sign it, called Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika, talks a little bit about that. Many people believe that arms agreements during this period when we are perhaps closer to a nuclear war than at any other time in history perhaps, except for when there was one when we dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. And then just to make sure they noticed, three days later we bombed us, did a second one on, on Nagasaki. But then when two got nuclear weapons, it was a deterrent for each. One side used it, the other side could, and that would destroy the world. So nuclear arms agreement in this day and age is very important. And Scott, this book, um, wrote about, about some of that. Um, I've missed a lot of Scott's uh, bio, um, but I'm going to just let him speak because he speaks for himself, uh, Scott Ritter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here tonight. Um, I think it's appropriate that we be holding. I'm going to move up here because it's blocking me. I know the microphone's supposed to catch my voice, so I'll shift it for you. But um, I think it's appropriate that we're here in the public library. Why? You know, I'm a former Marine, and when I took my oath, it was to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The key thing here is the Constitution of the United States of America. The First Amendment to the Constitution is freedom of speech. And that's sort of what we're doing here tonight. We're engaged in a process of free speech. Dan said some stuff, I'm going to say some stuff. I'm looking out at some of the eyes out there and I see people say, we don't agree with you. That's cool. That's good. Because that's what America's all about. See, I'm going to put some stuff out there. You may say, I disagree with you. We're going to have question and answer. You get to hold me accountable. Dan accountable for what we say. Then we engage in something called a debate, a discussion, a dialogue where we get to work it out peacefully because that's what America's about. Or at least I thought it was. You see, I came into this whole Ukraine conflict thing sort of by accident. As Joe uh, discussed, my specialty was the Middle East. My specialty was disarmament. 
I've been to Ukraine once. That was in 1997, part of the United Nations weapons inspections. I was investigating um, some information we had that Ukrainians uh, were dismantling Soviet-era weapons production capability and trying to illegally smuggle it into Iraq. My job was to prevent that. So I went to Kiev, met with the highest echelons of the Ukrainian government, but that's it. I don't claim to be an expert on Ukraine. So there it is. Anybody who says, Scott, why are you pretending you're an expert on Ukraine? I'm not. I'm not at all. I am an analyst, though. I am capable of absorbing data, assessing data, and drawing conclusions from that data. And I write for a number of outlets. One of those outlets, uh, Energy Intelligence, uh, in, in December published a, an article where I basically said, if there's a war in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, the following is going to happen. Ukraine will be destroyed as a modern nation state. This is not because I'm anti-Ukraine. It's because I'm an analyst looking at the totality of the data, recognizing that if it's a war between Ukraine and Russia, Russia will more than likely win, and that war will result in the destruction of the nation of Ukraine. At that time, the United States was talking about leading a global coalition to sanction Russia in an effort to deter a Russian invasion, and if Russia did invade, to punish Russia to the extent that their economy would collapse, the public would rise up, Putin would be threatened, and he would have to withdraw. And I said in December, if the United States goes forward with its sanction program, it will backfire. Russia will, ex will, will emerge victorious economically, and Europe and the United States will suffer severe economic consequences, so severe that Europe itself may face economic collapse. I said that in December 2021. And the last thing I said is, a Ukrainian-Russian conflict would probably trigger global change, just a geopolitical transformation that will see the world transition from a world where America is the global hegemon, the unilateral power around which everything revolves toward a multipolarity world where the United States is diminished and other players have risen up. At that time, it was considered to be very controversial. So controversial that the outlet really didn't want to publish it. But they did. And I'm proud to say that I was right on all of it. I'm not proud because I want to be right. I would have preferred that Russia didn't invade Ukraine. I would have preferred that Europe isn't going through this economic collapse. I would prefer that the United States isn't undergoing this kind of global transformation that it is in such an unplanned fashion. I have no problem with a multipolar world. I just would prefer that we did so with a plan as opposed to lurching and jerking to it. From that article, I was asked to write other articles as this, con as this crisis turned into a conflict. And lo and behold, people started calling me up and saying, hey, we'd like you on podcasts. I didn't do podcasts prior to that didn't want to do podcasts, but I did a podcast. One million views, it went viral. And suddenly everybody's calling up, asking me to be on their podcast, and people ask me to write things, and lo and behold, I'm suddenly a Ukraine expert. And what I found in putting out my opinion on Ukraine is that I irritated an awful lot of people. A lot of people out there went, we disagree with you. Fundamentally, we disagree with you viscerally, which is okay. I really don't mind that because, again, this is America, freedom of speech. I get to say what I want, you get to hold me accountable for it, that's wonderful. But that's not what happened. You see, suddenly in, um, in July 14th of last year, I was made aware of a conference that was held in Kiev, a conference that was uh, put forward by the United States State Department. They sponsored it. And the conference was involved this entity called the Center for, the Count uh, for Countering Disinformation. It's a, an office belonging to the president of Ukraine, and it basically it says, we exist to counter Russian propaganda. So far, so good. I don't have a problem. Except they published a list called a blacklist, and on that list, I featured prominently. I was called an information terrorist. I was called a war criminal. I was told that I should be arrested and prosecuted for crimes against humanity. Now, it doesn't bother me so much that the Ukrainians are doing this because they're a sovereign nation. They get to do what they want to do. What bothered me is that the U.S. taxpayer was footing the bill for that. 
the U.S. taxpayer was footing the bill based upon money allocated by the United States Congress in a bill passed in May of 2021 sending aid to Ukraine. Now, I don't know, when I read the Constitution in the First Amendment, it says that Congress shall not pass laws that abridge free speech. Well, I think Congress passing a law allocating money to Ukraine so that Ukraine, under the auspices of the State Department, can form a center for countering disinformation designed to intimidate and threaten American citizens from engaging in their First Amendment responsibilities and rights sort of violates the Constitution. And I felt strongly about it that I wrote a letter to my congressional representatives. I wrote to Chuck Schumer, I wrote to uh, Gillibrand, and I wrote to Paul Tonko. Schumer and Gillibrand, they didn't respond, didn't expect them to. Tonko did, but it was boilerplate letter. And the interesting thing about this letter is even though he addresses my concern about the resolution allocating the money, he didn't address the issue at all about me being put on a blacklist. Instead, he simply said that he condemns Vladimir Putin's unprovoked war against Ukraine. It's a clear violation of international law and on and on and on and so forth. Another list that I got put on because of this CCD taxpayer funded thing was something called the Mir Tvoritz list. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's literally a hit list. It's a death list. They kill people on that list. Oh, really? Uh, Daria Dugina didn't die on that list. Her name wasn't there. They didn't put a line through her face. They liquidated. They don't brag about this. They kill people. And it's run by the SBU, which is the Ukrainian Intelligence yeah, Service. How would people kill? Uh, a lot of people were killed on that list. But it, you can, you can, we can talk about this any way you want. My name's on the list. You can't deny that. People whose names on the list are targeted for death. You can't deny that. So there we are. And again, U.S. taxpayer money being used to fund this. Now, why do I bring this up? One, I'd like Paul Tonko held accountable for this. He is my representative. He voted for money to be allocated to your Ukrainian government for the purpose of suppressing my free speech, either by intimidation, calling me an information terrorist, seeking to have me arrested as a war criminal, or transferring my name to the Mir Tvoritz hit list so that maybe somebody will kill me. Um, but the other thing is, I'm bringing it up because in his response to me, Tonko talked about Vladimir Putin's illegal war of aggression in violation of international law. You know, we can talk all day about the war in Ukraine. We can talk about U.S. money being provided to them. We can talk about what's going on in the battlefield. We can agree or disagree. You know, did Russia try and take Kiev in, in February and March? That's up for debate. Um, you know, was it a game-changing event when the United States provided tens of billions of dollars worth of equipment to the Ukrainian military, enabling them to launch counteroffensives in Kharkov and Kherson? Are the Russians incompetent? Are the Ukrainians incompetent? Are people dying in large numbers on the Russian side, on the Ukraine side? It all can be discussed, but really that's sort of over here. The key element here is who is on the right side of history? Who is on the right side of history? Where do the players in this fall when it comes to international law? And Paul Tonko clearly believes that Russia's on the wrong side of history, that Russia has violated international law. To assess that, why don't we take a look at the Russian claim? Russia claims that the justification for its actions in Ukraine are found in the United Nations Charter, specifically Article 51, which is the self-defense charter. Now, people are going to say, hey, Scott, Russia attacked Ukraine. So uh, how can it be self-defense? Good question. Except when you study international law, you understand that self-defense includes a clause called preemptive self-defense, meaning that you don't have to sit there and get punched in the face, that if somebody's getting ready to knock you in the teeth, you get to take them right out. Boom, preemptive self-defense. But the key aspect to that is, A, it has to be an imminent threat to you, and B, the fighting in the Donetsk is not Russia. It's not Russia. The fighting in the Donbass is in Ukraine. It's an internal Ukrainian problem. So how does Russia justify self-defense by intervening in Ukraine? Geez, I don't know. Maybe what happened is Lugansk and Donetsk held a referendum, declared independence. That independence was recognized by Russia. And then Russia engaged in something called collective security arrangement. The reason why I bring that up is that Russia didn't invent this concept. The United States invented this concept in 1999. 
How do you think we justified NATO intervention against Serbia in 1999? Collective self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, citing the imminent threat posed by the Serbians to the population of Kosovo through genocidal activities. And therefore, NATO, wait a minute, NATO is not a member of the United Nations. How can NATO possibly cite the United Nations Charter to justify military action because they're engaged in a collective security agreement with the United States, who is a member of the United Nations, just like Russia is a member of the United Nations, Lugansk and Donetsk are not, but once they enter a collective security arrangement, it becomes a legitimate thing. So, Russia has a case under international law. We can debate it, people can disagree with me, but the notion straight up, the Pomp Tonko says, that Russia is in clear violation of international law, I'm telling you right now, it ain't that black and white. Russia has articulated a clearly cognizant case under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, that it is carrying out preemptive self-defense against a threat posed by the Ukrainians. Now here comes the important part. Because people are going to say, well Scott, doesn't the threat have to be real? Doesn't it have to be imminent? And you're right. In order for all of this to work, the threat posed by Russia has to be real, and it, or by Ukraine has to be real, and it has to be imminent. Let's back up for a second. April 2008, a gentleman named William Burns at the time, he was the U.S. ambassador to Russia, wrote a memorandum to the President of the United States. That memorandum was titled, <laughs> Nyet means Nyet, no means no. Pretty straightforward. What was the memorandum about? He basically said, if NATO invites Ukraine to join NATO, it will lead to a s escalation of tensions between Russia and Ukraine and the West that will inevitably result and a Russian military intervention that will cause Ukraine to lose the Donbass and Crimea. April 2008 is when this memorandum was written. The United States ambassador to Russia, one of the top experts about Russia in the United States, is warning the U.S. government that if we invite Ukraine in, the ultimate outcome will be a conflict between Russia and Ukraine that results in Ukraine losing significant portions of its territory. It's not guesswork, ladies and gentlemen. We said right up, April 2008, that's what's going to happen. November 2008, we invite Ukraine to join NATO. Which means that we knew through that invitation what was going to happen. It's not a surprise. We knew that by inviting Ukraine into NATO, it would lead to an escalation of tension that would result in Russian military intervention. Was it inevitable? No. But we knew we were setting up the case. <coughs> 2014, a coup. Now some people take issue with that, they call it a revolution. I call it a coup. It's an unconstitutional effort to overthrow the constitutionally elected government of Viktor Yanukovych by people who did not have legal constitutional authority to do so. The right sector and other far right elements supported by the United States. I mean, it is Victoria Newland, after all, who was a senior State Department official who was intercepted on the phone bragging about her boy Yats, Yatsenko. America's choice to be Prime Minister of Ukraine. Why is it America's choice? I mean, after all, isn't Ukraine a sovereign state? Why is the United States deciding who's going to be leading it? Because it ain't about the Ukrainian people or the will of Ukraine. It's about the United States seeking to weaken Russia by overthrowing a pro-Russian government, Viktor Yanukovych, and replacing it with Ukrainian nationalists who would be working on behalf of the United States. <coughs> now we get the conflict. In, in August, September of 2014, the conflict in Donbass is, is on fire. In, in early August, the, uh, the Ukrainian army went in and, and threatened to surround the Donetsk uh, militias. There was, it looked like it was going to be game, set, match Ukraine. But then superior forces, which probably included some Russian military, counterattacked and surrounded them. Now it's game, set, match Russia. 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers surrounded, and they ain't going to get out. They're all going to die. So what happens? The Ukrainians get together with their European allies and say, please help us negotiate a settlement. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, flies all over the place. She meets with Hollande, the President of France, and they meet with the Russians, they meet with OSCE, they meet with Ukrainians, and they come up with the Minsk Accords. The Minsk Accords. Now, the first one in Minsk 2014 has some difficulty. In 2015, they solidified it up, but the bottom line of the Minsk Accords is this. There will be a ceasefire. 
During that ceasefire, the border will be brought under control by the Ukrainian government because Russia had no territorial objectives in Ukraine. Russia said that the Donbass is Ukraine, sovereign Ukraine. But in order for this to happen, Ukraine must pass resolu or constitutional amendments that protect the rights of ethnic Russians in Ukraine. The same people who were burned to death in Odessa, the same people who were slaughtered in Mariupol, slaughtered in the Donbass, their rights need to be protected. This was agreed to by Ukraine, by Germany, by France. Agreed to. They took this to the United Nations Security Council and they said, give us a resolution that backs this up because we're all serious about this. How serious were they? Minsk was never, ever implemented by Ukraine. And Germany and France did not put pressure on Ukraine to implement it. Russia was begging for implementation all through the eight years, all the way up to the end. When Joe Biden met with um, Vladimir Putin in Geneva, one of the key talking points was Putin turning to Biden and saying, if you want all this to go away, implement Minsk. And Biden said, I promise you, we will do that. I'm tasking Tony Blink and the Secretary of State to get this done. It didn't get done. Why? We now know why. Exhibit A, Petro Poroshenko, president, former president of Ukraine, gives a speech in which he says, it was a sham, a sham. Minsk was never serious. We only did Minsk to buy time to build up the Ukrainian military so that we could militarily defeat the Russians. So in 2014, 2015, instead of seeking peace, we now know that Ukraine was actually buying time to go to war against whom? Russia. That's okay, that's, that's Poroshenko speaking. He's a nationalist, he's a little fanatic. Maybe we don't take his words too seriously. Angela Merkel gives an interview after she leaves office. She says the same thing. Minsk was a fraud, a sham, to buy time for NATO to train the Ukrainian military for what purpose? to defeat the Russians. And now Hollande, the French president, says the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ukrainians, the French, the Germans, NATO, the United States, were never serious about peace. From 2008 until 2022, they focused on one thing and one thing only, creating the conditions for the Ukrainian military to engage and defeat the Russian military for the purpose of one, liberating from their point of view the Donbass, and two, pushing the Russians out of Crimea. Now, this is intent. Where's the action? 2015, the United States sets up a major training base in western Ukraine. In that training base, we trained one battalion of Ukrainian troops every 55 days for seven straight years. 30,000 Ukrainian troops were trained in NATO standards and equipped. For what purpose? The U.S. Army puts out a slide and brags about it. We train the Ukrainians here, and they draw an arrow so they can go and fight the Russians here. This was never about peace, ladies and gentlemen. So now we come to what happened on February uh, 24th of last year. Was this an unprovoked war of aggression, as Paul Tonko claims? Or did Russia actually have a case for legitimate self-defense, preemptive self-defense? And I would say that if NATO has trained a Ukrainian force of 60 to 90,000 men, the intent of which is to go to war against Russia, even though you have a Minsk Accord that says we're not going to do that, the intent is quite clear. Now, we can debate this. We can disagree with this. But my point is it's not black and white. It's not a, you know, just an easily shut case. You can't sit there and say, no, Russia's wrong, Ukraine's right. That's not how it works. But here's the other thing about that. There's no more trust between Russia and the West, none whatsoever. Now, initially, it was because the West said Russia violated international law, carrying out an unprovoked uh, act of aggression against Ukraine. But now we see it's a little bit murkier than that. The West was never serious about peace, never serious about peace. The Minsk Accords mean nothing. Merkel's signature means nothing. Hollande's signature means nothing. Poroshenko's signature means nothing. The West means nothing. And why is this important? Because Russia has thermonuclear warheads, ladies and gentlemen. So does the United States. NATO has nuclear weapons. Russia's now extended its nuclear umbrella into Belarus. If this thing goes hot between NATO and the United States, the world ends. It's that simple. There's no such thing as limited nuclear war. There is no such thing as limited nuclear war. If there is a nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States, we all die. 
every single one of us. None of us will live. So now we have to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this mess? And that's the most fundamental question. How do we get out of this mess? There has to be negotiation. You know, if I told you that um, I started to build a scenario, I said, you know, once upon a time, there was a, 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 an era where the United States and the Russians didn't like each other, where the United States was called, or called the Russians the evil empire, and the Russians called America enemy number one, that the United States was funding a resistance movement in a nation that bordered Russia with billions of dollars for the sole purpose of killing Russian soldiers to weaken Russia, that the United States was leading sanctions against Russian energy, that American and Russian forces were faced off threatening to fight one another, you'd say, yeah, that's today. I'd say, nah, that's the 1980s, ladies and gentlemen, the 1980s. We were at more risk of going to war against the Soviet Union in the 1980s than we are going against Russia today. It was a very, very dangerous time. We didn't like each other, we didn't trust each other. And yet somehow we got through it. How? Through arms control. And that's the, the book I wrote, The Disarm of the Time of Perestroika, talks about this. Talks about the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Talks about how two sides that didn't trust one another came together to form this treaty. <coughs> they got rid of an entire category of nuclear weapons that threatened peace and security around the world. And the reason why I bring this up is the only way out of this mess today between the United States and Russia <coughs> is through negotiation. And what are we going to negotiate about? We're going to negotiate about the thing that's of fundamental importance, the number one thing. <coughs> and that's arms control. I just had lunch with the Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov. He's a former arms control guy helped negotiate the uh, New START Treaty. And he, um, he said he doesn't see any hope because Russia doesn't trust the United States. The United States doesn't trust Russia. They're not talking at all. <coughs> unless we find a way to talk, unless we find a way to overcome our differences, we're going to face a new arms race. And we see that now. Russia just deployed a frigate with a new class of hypersonic missiles that can have nuclear warheads. These missiles cannot be shot down by any air defense system possessed by the United States or the West. So if they're launched, they will hit the target, they will destroy the target, and if they're using a nuclear weapon, the world's over. The United States is getting ready to deploy a new weapon called Dark Eagle. It's an intermediate range missile. We're going to send it over to Europe of all places, where if it's launched, it's five to seven minutes away from striking Moscow. Why is that important? Because if there's ever an accident, if there's ever a misunderstanding, and the Russians think a Dark Eagle missile has been fired, they're going to respond per their doctrine. It is once launch is detected, we launch everything. The world ends. The world ends, ladies and gentlemen. There's no debating that point. How do we prevent this? We're going to need a new Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. We're going to need a new arms control agreement. And people say it's hopeless, but I tell you it's not. In the 80s, people thought it was hopeless. In the 1980s, they thought you could never get Ronald Reagan, cold warrior that he was, to sit down with his Soviet counterpart and agree to get rid of nuclear weapons. But they did it. And we're going to have to learn how to do it again. But the only way we're going to get down that path is by empowering ourselves with knowledge and information so that we can engage in debate, discussion, and dialogue about the important issues of the day, which today include not just the issue between Russia and Ukraine, but Russia and the United States, nuclear disarmament, and finding a path to peace. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions anybody has. So I suggest that we take a, a few questions, um, and then we can see if the uh, people want to answer them. I see your hand. I'm going to call on you. Um, so, but um, uh, I would ask people to be respectful in their comments and questions. I would ask people to be short so others can have the floor to speak, um, and then we'll go from there. I'm going to call on this young person first. And that woman in the yellow second. Uh, very soon, there's this going to be nuclear war. Everybody, at least. Say, say it again and I'll repeat what you're saying. Probably 50 of the people 
in Ukraine do what? I mean, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have died. I think what he said is that um, uh, many people in Ukraine and I think in Russia have died. Um, I think that's the point, and I think the point and is that we don't want to see that. Is that correct? Sure. The Russian government and the Putin and the president of Ukraine, well, war. That you Putin and the president of, of Ukraine should what? Want war. To want war, he says. And the, the civilians of Russia and Ukraine don't. And the, the civilians soldiers. don't. The soldiers of <coughs> Russia and Ukraine don't. And the soldiers don't. Okay, people can we leave it at that and then see what other people have? People and thank you for, for your thoughts. <laughs> okay. The woman in yellow and then uh, the man here with the beard. I would like to have a word afterwards. A what? Uh, just to have a speech, to, to talk a little bit afterwards, if it's possible. Well, why don't you ask the questions now and we'll see how, how okay, long things go. Okay, the question is now, uh, Mr. Kavalik was uh, naming uh, a lot of facts which reminds me exactly Russian propaganda. I speak three languages. I speak Russian, Ukrainian, and English. So I understand all the languages and I'm following the events. So all the events which um, Mr. Kvalik was mentioning reminds exactly what Russian propaganda does. So my question is, are there any uh, international evidences of those tortures or killing kids which were exampled by Mr. Kvalik? For example, when Ukraine liberated its territory, Bucha, Irpin, Gastomil, uh, Kherson, Izum, everywhere they found the torture rooms. Immediately they called international organizations and established the facts. They, they invite the international observers and it is internationally uh, approved facts of torturing people in, in Kherson even was um, um, discovered the children's torture room, children's yeah. Yeah. torture room, and it is international now facts approved by United Nations. Are there any international facts? Of course, so, I already. Yes. Yeah. Let's just get a couple more questions. Right. Right. If you could break that down, and we'll. we'll and the other that. question is, um, it was uh, again, it wasn't more in Mr. Kavalik. He was saying. Ukrainian government is bombing Ukrainian government. Uh, according to Minsk agreement, Donetsk and Lugansk were territories of Ukraine, just uh, sort, sort of republics inside Ukraine, so it was still Ukraine. Only after Russia opened the, uh, this aggression, before the day before, they admitted by themselves, it is not internationally accepted. They admitted this is the territory of Russia. So, before this 24th, February 24th, that was Ukraine. And he was saying that Ukrainian government, Ukrainian government, what Ukrainian government he means? It was Ukraine, and the government was Ukrainian, and that was evidences, the bombing and all this, uh, whatever evidences were from the um, unaccepted <coughs> sort of governments of these republics. Yeah. It understand. was not government of Ukraine, it was self-elected self, uh, government, yes. which are mostly bandits. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to thank both the gentlemen for a wonderful presentation. One aspect, though, that I didn't hear mentioned, whenever we, anything happens in the world, the way to find out why it's happening is ask who benefits. 
who's making the money from it? He said, we don't know where it's going. We know where it's going. It's going into the pockets of the weapons manufacturer. Yes. They lost a, 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 a lucrative market in Afghanistan, and I don't know that they cared that, you know, once they got their money for the weapons, if they ended up in the hands of the Taliban. So we're sending now weapons to Ukraine. It's a, it, it's, an, it's an even more lucrative market. If those weapons end up in the hands of the Russians, I don't think they can once their pockets are filled. Okay. Do any, do you have any ideas as, 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 as to how we, they, these, these are the people that control the media. They, you know, they have, they, they bought our government. They did. Eisenhower warned us against mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's take one more and we'll, we'll, we'll you. get some answers and then we'll go back to more people. Go yeah, on. yeah, thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, you say that we have to do this. We have to come up with a solution. We, if it's my generation, we, my, our generation, we're screwed. Because my generation left a, a pile of rubbish, okay? So when you say we have to come up with a solution, we have to do it, who do you have in mind? Who is the we in your we? Thank you. Join us on the visuals on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, would you guys like to answer these questions? Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. I cited the UN High Commissioner on human rights. You had a report, had numerous reports on what was happening in Donbass, who did conclude 14,000 people died before February 24th of 2022. I, in fact, I've been writing about this for years, and I would often cite Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, who was very concerned by human rights violations by Ukrainian forces and by allied forces like Azov against the population in the Donbass. Now that's not to say that the militias of the Donbass didn't commit human rights abuses as well or that the Russians aren't committing human rights abuses now. But what I'm saying is there are well-documented abuses by the Ukrainian government over the last nine years. And again, I interviewed people who were victims of it, which I think is worth, uh, you know, worth something. The other thing I'll say is, in terms of your issue about the imminence of the attack against the Donbass in February 2022, you can go and look at the Organization for European <coughs> Security and Cooperation, the OESC. That is a 57-member organization. The U.S. is a member of that organization. Germany, there is a German who's the head of it. There are many Western countries part of that organization. They reported the weekend before the special operations began in February, there were 2,000 ceasefire violations. Between mostly no. the Kiev shelling no. the Donbass. 40,000 Ukrainians on our side died, on the democratic side, not on the bandit it's side. That's not true. The same report had a breakdown. The same report had a breakdown, but 40,000 was a breakdown. Okay. And let me you know. say something else. How many are Ukrainians? That you, that you consider the people, the Donbass bandits, says a lot about the view of how those people are viewed in Ukraine. And by the way, they don't share that view of people in Western Ukraine, but the fact that you view them as bandits instead of human beings is very concerning. And that's part of the problem, because the government of Kiev considers them undermentioned, subhuman, as you do. And that's a big problem. Respectful and give people the ability to... Why is it you're Ukrainian up there? Okay, all right. What's um, going on here? Yeah, because don't put Ukrainian on your path. Um, what are you doing? Yeah, I have to down. If you'd like, the Congress of the United States. Please, please, please allow me to respond to the young lady who asked the question about war. Young lady. Is she here? How about woman? Say again? You can say She's woman instead of woman. She's in the back. I don't understand what she's saying. I said. You don't talk to women like young ladies or women. She's no, there was a little girl on the run. Talk about the, 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 the young lady who came up and asked the question. Oh, no, okay, no. can I talk? No, no. Got an objection? She, talk, she asked a, a very fundamental question. A very fundamental question. And I'm glad it came from a child. Because it's a question that didn't come from anybody else in this room. Basically, why are we at war? 
Why, 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 why are Ukrainian people dying and Russian people dying? Why is this happening? Is it because the Russian leader and the Ukrainian leader want a war when the people don't want a war? It's a fundamentally fair question. And what it means, and, and, and I don't have an answer for that, except to highlight what she's saying. War is hell. War should be avoided at all costs. Whatever disagreements we may have must be settled peacefully because the alternative is what we see right now in Ukraine. Wherever you stand on the issue, understand this. As we speak, a Ukrainian soldier is dying. As we speak, a Russian soldier is dying. And it's going to happen again and again and again for as long as this conflict goes on. Now, why is this happening? Was every option short of war exhausted before war became the only option? Because I think that's fundamentally what she's asking all of us to do, to exhaust every option short of war before we go to war. Now I come to your question. What do I want you to do? What I want you to do, I want everybody in this room to do, is if you have a problem with war, and you think war is one of the most fundamental issues we confront today as a society and a civilization, then start holding to account those who lead us to war, and that's the Congress of the United States. Paul Tonko right here can write letters like this because he's, a, he's not afraid. Paul Tonko runs unopposed. Paul Tonko doesn't have to be primary. Paul Tonko doesn't have to be held accountable for garbage like this. You want to do something? Find somebody who can primary Paul Tonko and debate him and force him to answer the questions. I'm answering this question. I'm answering his question. You get to answer your, ask yours and I'll answer yours afterwards. I'm answering his question. Thank okay. you. Let's, let's let uh, speak. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a Ra uh, Russian American, a proud Russian American, because Ra Russians have a very proud history. However, I am ashamed of what's happening right now, and I think James Connolly would be ashamed. James Connolly died uh, fighting against imperialists, um, uh, British imperialists, and now Russians are the imperialists. So I am ashamed of Russian leadership currently. And uh, when you mention Odessa, you, you seem to have um, uh, forgotten the pro-Maidan folks that were killed by the uh, Russians uh, there. You seem to have forgotten Anton Rayevsky, who was arrested and who had a recording saying that all Ukraine, uh, uh, that the uh, um, Eastern uh, Ukraine should be cleansed of Ukrainians. Uh, Ukrainian language should be for, uh, um, uh, forgotten there, and um, uh, this uh, thing. So we, uh, when you uh, talk about the Donbass and Lugansk, you forget the GRU, the folks that were uh, that had the passports from the Russian special forces took over government there. And now in my, uh, you talk about Maidan being a coup, but that's, uh, that's false because the uh, constitutional uh, um, it was a constitutional process for replacing the, the president there. So we're talking about uh, agreements, but you talk about lies, and there's uh, several lies here. There's a lies about Odessa that doesn't give a full story. There's, uh, there's lies about uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, when um, uh, tat uh, Tatars were uh, exterminated there, there's li lies about Holodomor, um, uh, there's lies about uh, the 14,000. Now, the 14,000 people that you mentioned, uh, do you know the breakdown? How many of us were Ukrainian soldiers? It's in the same report that you mentioned. You tell me. You tell me. I'll tell you how much. It, it's uh, five, uh, about uh, 4,995 Ukrainian soldiers, about 6,000 of uh, um, armed separatists, and about 3,000 uh, civilians. So uh, you, when you talk about the 14,000 uh, people uh, killed, you can't talk about the 14,000 killed by, by the Ukrainians. You have to consider that that part of the conflict, both sides were wrong. Now, Minsk, uh, going back to Minsk resolutions, it was Russia that didn't implement the Minsk resolutions because Russia didn't want to give up the control of the border. That was part of the Minsk resolutions that Russia failed to implement. Do you know about that? Has Russia ever given up a, a part of, a of a control of the border? 
per pertaining to the Minsk resolutions. Did, uh, did Ukraine pass the Ukraine. constitutional amendment? Uh, uh, Ukraine did pass. Um, um, uh, Ukraine did pass a resolution uh, giving the autonomy to Donbass. Yes, that, that is that is true. Same thing as uh, um, uh, I have heard the Joe's argument that uh, a Russian language was for, forbidden. It, um, that's also another falsehood. There was no law forbidding Russian language. Uh, so I'm I'm a proud Russian, uh, and I um, actually uh, I uh, heard another thing that Scott said to Russians, uh, like my friend here Sam, who had to uh, flee Russia uh, because. He would otherwise be killed because he would be sent to this war. He had to flee Russia through uh, crossing the border in, in Georgia. Uh, um, and, uh, two days crossing the border in Georgia, going to from Georgia to Mexico, crossing the border in Mexico, being detained uh, in the United States. This young man fled because he didn't want to spend 10 years in Russian prison. Uh, and he didn't want to kill Ukrainians because no Russian wants to uh, kill uh, Ukrainians except uh, uh, under the force of, uh, of, uh, of Putin. And so when you talk about whose fault it is, undoubtedly the, the, the man who ordered the uh, invasion, Vladimir Putin. There is no other person. And you talk about General Antonov, Ambassador Antonov. I had many lunches with Ambassador Antonov. Ambassador Antonov is the big, biggest propagandist you could find. He likes controlled environment. Every meeting he had with the Russian community here in the United States, he made sure that all questions were pre-screened, that he, uh, he, uh, nobody was allowed to ask any kind of questions from the Russian community to the ambassador unless they were pre-screened. This guy is the biggest propagandist, and it's a shame you do have uh, uh, Ukrainian blood on your hands when you talk, uh, when you defend Russia, and when you say that Russian invasion was justified. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, and, and that's a fact. And um, uh, you, uh, it's 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 horrible what uh, what's what's being done uh, here, and um, uh, half troops are being spread about Nazis. Yes. Ukraine here had one to two percent uh, of electoral support for for the right wing government. One to two percent. That's not all Ukrainians. That is not uh, that was not part of the Ukrainian government. Ukraine is led by a Jew. There are many Jews in the uh, in Ukrainian government. Ukrainian government is far from being Nazi. Uh, uh, however, Russian government currently is has passed the uh, all kinds of laws. Uh, to, um, uh, that was similar to, to the laws that they opposed. My um, grandfather's parents were killed in Donbass because they were opposing, because they were part of uh, uh, union uh, leaders. Um, uh, they in uh, coal fac uh, a factory called Mainzwe, the who were opposed to the government that, uh, that the Russians installed. Now, Boris Nemtsov was also killed in Russia because he, he said how much, uh, you, you're talking about how much America spends in, in Ukraine, how much Russia spent in Ukraine in 2014, 2015. Millions and millions and millions of billions of dollars that they spent and Boris Nemtsov was killed after he exposed that report. Okay, let's, uh, there's a whole lot of people here and I just want to, before we do that, since you addressed me specifically, um, on the Russian language issue. It was the first law asked by the cool government. The United States then went and said, no, you can't do this, but it did come back. The second law was to outlaw the biggest party in Ukraine, which was the Party of Regions, which was the party that um, wanted to be friendly to both Europe and Russia. The next thing they did was outlaw the second largest party in Ukraine, which was the Communist Party, which wanted to be friendly to no Russia. Law, no such law. And You're at lying. this point, every opposition party in Ukraine has been banned. These are the facts. Well, the um, when we were in Odessa, we were escorted around by a former police chief in Odessa who quit after the Odessa massacre. He was in charge of the police brigade that was at the football game. There was a football game between two um, cities in Ukraine. They came together. And uh, th this was the excuse that a lot of the right-wing forces used to come there. 
He said, at one point, everybody's cell phones rang. The game wasn't over. They all got up and they marched to, pre-planned, they marched to the House of Trade Unionists and that's where the massacre happened. That's what he after, said. After people and were he, killed. And the people that were killed were, by and large, I think all of them were, were people that were protesting the coup that took place. So this is... This is they were, they were now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You had a chance. Let's me call on some other people. I'm going to call on one, two, three, and then, then let's, let's have the stuff. All right. One, two, three. Go on. 32 years ago, um, I was a senior at Bethlehem High School, uh, right up the road here. And it was just this time of year, we were having some similar discussions about Saddam Hussein, who was considered to be the butcher of Baghdad. And there was a, a lot of uh, drum beating for, for bombing Iraq and pointing to the invasion of Kuwait. And I was the co-chair at the time of a group called the Students for Peace and Survival. And uh, despite the sort of pacifism in that name, it was that discussion that we had that convinced me that American workers, ordinary American people, had a side in conflicts when the imperialist nation that we live in the belly of the beast of uh, oppresses and bombs other nations, and uh, that, that we have a responsibility for solidarity and a side. And it led me to believe that you could take a side, you know, that you could be for the defeat of U.S. imperialism and defend Iraq without apologizing for the regime of uh, Saddam Hussein. Yes. And, and we have the same thing here. Yes. Oh, no, I totally disagree with you, actually. I am saying I, I am for Russia. Uh, I believe that Russia is doing what it must do, both to protect the Donbass and to protect its own security interests. And, and as much as I do not support Vladimir Putin, the American working class has a side, and it is for the defeat of the Ukraine, which is acting as a proxy for the US and NATO imperialism. And anybody who thinks NATO is purely a defensive organization is not paying attention to the role that, that, that uh, uh, NATO played in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Serbia. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think the point of following the money is a very good point in, in addition to that, because we've seen something like $80 billion being spent on sending Patriot missiles and high-tech military hardware and military trainers to, to you know, fight this war. There were assurances that were historically given that nobody touched on, but I think a lot of people have heard, going all the way back to the Gorbachev era, that there would not be this encirclement of Russia, and yet it did, and it did it to the point where it had become an existential threat and where this was a defensive action, setting aside even the fact that the people of the Donbass the Russian language speaking people have a right to self-determination. Right. Whoever is pointing to the fact that there were no torture dungeons, well, you don't see it in, in, in U.S. media, but Venezuelan state media did report that some of the dungeons that were misattributed to being Russian torture dungeons were in fact torture dungeons of the Azov Battalion. Right? But you won't see that in the U.S. media, but you can see it in the Venezuelan state media. Can we go on so we could get so, some other people? Sure. I had one, two, and one, two. Yes. So on, on One is that we need to be out of here at 8:45. The the library closes. It's not negotiable. Okay. So if you're in the middle of a meeting discussion, you got to take it outside. Okay. Second, my second point is, it seems to me that a lot of people came here tonight not to hear what our speakers had to say, but because you're absolutely sure whose fault this is. But I don't understand how knowing whose fault it is solves the problem. Right. What if it is Russia? Okay, what if it is? What Exit. are we going to do Exit. about it? Exit. Are we going to have a nuclear war? Is it worth a nuclear war? No. How no. many hundred billion dollars do you want to put into this war? How many hundred million people have to die? Uh, defeat do we, of Russia. Do we have to defeat destroy Russia. Ukraine to beat the Russians? Defeat is that Russia. what we have to do? As God so eloquently said, we're looking at nuclear war. Yes. Are you willing to take that Ukraine risk? Ukraine is protecting everyone from this nuclear okay. war. Uh, Russian have, regime is the only negotiator. You, you had a chance to speak it, it and, and nobody stopped, stopped you from Russia speaking. So let, let the other people speak and then we will, we will get as many as possible. Russia does speak 
ever seen opposite. Yeah. Okay, we heard what you, they, and you did have a chance to speak, and you will, okay. let's let other people, if not, you're, you are next. Right, so I hope I'm not so rudely interrupted as the last speaker was. Okay. I think you all deserve our chance, and I'm not going to shout over anyone. Um, I want to cast our mind backwards and then forwards. Can you speak a bit louder, louder then? A bit louder. There was something called the RAND report, which is in the public domain, which is a kind of step-by-step -step guide to using Ukraine to weaken Russia. You can look it up. It's been updated recently. I think other people will be able to say what I said. Secondly, I want us to look forward. You know, we are not each other's enemies. These things are set to us, some propagandized to us, so that we will find fault and fight with each other. We, here in this room, are a small local community and we are not each other's enemies. You're right. What we have to do is realize who the enemy actually is. Because divide and conquer has been a mantra throughout the millennium. So yeah, we yeah. have to sit back, stand back from the propaganda and think, who's really making money out of this? Who's really gaining more power out of this? And who stands most by keeping us all down. I just want to say a couple things in response to some of the things said. First of all, in terms of the breakdown of the 14,000 people who died from 2014 to February of 2022, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the numbers you gave. And what I said is 14,000 people died. I didn't give a breakdown of that. Uh, but what it shows is that we agree on something. This war started in 2014. There's no disagreement on that, right? That is something the media has obscured, which I'm sure you know about. Uh, and maybe you didn't even know 14,000 people died since 2014. Uh, but certainly the media hasn't been talking to us about it and hasn't covered the war for nine years, as it should have, and had it, we'd have very dis dif different discussions in Congress about this. Um, I will stand by the OECD figure that there were 2,000 ceasefire violations the weekend before Russia invaded. 2,000 which is a significant amount of ceasefire violations. Again, in a war that apparently, again, according to the media, didn't even from exist which side? until February. Violations from which side? Both sides, but mostly it was shelling upon the Donbass, which, again, I witnessed while I was there and even more since I left. Yes? You keep hitting on media, but I want everybody to know there's a huge difference between a national media outlet and a global media. Your local media, we're here for you, we're even here for you. We care about our local stats and what's happening. So please, can you keep it correct when you're talking national media? Well, I'm media sorry. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry. But you, you also put national media on that is totally skewed. This like Fox stuff. News? Fox yeah. News is pro is pro -proof? Yeah. So well, out. I wouldn't say. But in any case, I think there are things we agree on. That this war has lasted for nine years that I don't think we've been well educated about that, that I think if we had been, there'd be much different debate about it, that I think people who are raising that issue, their voices are being suppressed. And I think, again, it just underscores that we need to have honest discussions about what's happening. Again, and frankly, without telling people, oh, if you take a line, a certain line, you're you know, you have Ukrainian blood on your hands. No one said that about the Iraq War when people were saying there were weapons of mass destruction that oh, weren't yes, there. We did. Right? Oh, yes, well, we did. some of you did. Yes, I yes, we did. We, of course we did. Of course we did. But in any case, to to have a discussion about this issue does not put blood on your hands, and I wouldn't accuse others of having Russian blood on their hands or whatever. Um, and again, I think it shows the tenor of this debate, which isn't much of a debate. It's mostly one side that we're hearing, and I'm glad that people came to at least hear the other side. Um, and again, I think there are some certain agreements on some basic facts. Go ahead, Scott. All right, I, I'm going to hit three quick points. You mentioned that, uh, and you're correct, that the Nazi problem politically in Ukraine is a small problem. 
I don't know what the exact percentage is. I think it, you know, whether it's 2%, 3%, doesn't matter. The problem is here too. Okay, hey, ma'am, 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 ma I'm question. addressing the question. The gentleman brought, raised the point and I'm addressing it. Okay, let me do that. But let me put it this way. A small number of people who use violence as a tool of intimidation have greater power. And it's the Nazis in Ukraine who have bragged about this. They have bragged about their ability to use the threat of violence and actual violence to intimidate people. And one of the most effective means of threatening people is through these neo-Nazi paramilitary groups like Azov, Idar, Kraken, and others, who have become part of the regular Ukrainian army. And there's tens of thousands of them. Now, here in the United States, if we allowed, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan, who I think we would agree, uh, if there was an election, would get very small percentage of the vote. So politically, small. But we know that the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups organize in the militias. And if the United States government said, hey, why don't we make the Ku Klux Klan militias regular army and bring them into the army without changing any aspect of that, I will tell you right now, we got a Ku Klux Klan problem. Ukraine has a Nazi problem. Now here we come to part two. The gentleman raised the issue of who's benefiting. Understand this, NATO has been on the decline for many, many years since the end of the Cold War. Funding for the militaries has dropped, the militaries have atrophied, and when Afghanistan came up, there was hope that in NATO that they could use Afghanistan as a means to leverage NATO into the global scene. Well, Afghanistan backfired. NATO and the aftermath of Afghanistan, go look at their summits, was struggling to find a mission, and they found that mission in Ukraine. Right now, NATO is using the Ukraine conflict as justification for hundreds of billions of dollars worth of military budgets that they're planning to rebuild NATO, rearm NATO, re-equip NATO. That, so that's who's benefiting. There's a huge impotence to use the Ukrainian conflict. And the reason why I bring this up is my third and final point. The money we're sending to Ukraine has allowed Ukraine to reconstitute what was in June of this year or last year a largely defeated military. Ukraine has suffered horrific casualties, horrific casualties. But thanks to the tens of billions of dollars of direct military assistance, they were able to reconstitute their military and carry out very effective operations in September and October, liberating Kharkiv, liberating Kherson. Um, but now Russia has responded by mobilizing 300,000 reservists. And they're equipping these reservists with the most modern equipment that the Russian defense industry. Okay, you can shake your head no, sir, whatever. I'm just telling you right now that as we speak, two military forces are being built up that are going to fight one another. And this war is going to go on and on and on and on, and the end result is tens if not hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. That's a statement of fact. It doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong, this is the reality. The money that U.S. taxpayers are allowing our Congress to pour in Ukraine will directly result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. And you have to ask yourself, A, is that the right thing to do? And B, is that the proper use of U.S. taxpayer money? And these are fair questions that we should be allowed to debate, discuss in a non-confrontational manner. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to call on people that we haven't called on yet. Um, one, two, three. Oh, I'll put you as four. I did this woman in front of you. So, All right, I'm sorry. So one of your you. points was that we should not look at what caused the war and who's at fault, but look at how we get out of this situation. The only thing that I have heard is that Ukraine should give up its territory that belongs to their, it's their territory. It's illegally annexed, you know, pieces of it to Russia. Uh, so should Ukraine just give up? And do you feel that if they do, that the killing will stop? That Zelensky and his family are dead already if they give up? What should the Ukrainians do to defend themselves at this point? Well, I think if I can... Um, 
John. Uh, for Mr. Ritter, um, have you yourself received money from RT, Russian News? <laughs> yes. You want to know how much? You want to look at my tax returns? Yes. <laughs> Is it really in your damn business? But I answered the question. Do uh, you want to ask me how much money I earned from Consortium News? Do you want to ask me how much money I earned from Truth Dig? How much money I earned from American Conservative? How much money I earned from other outlets? Why are you focused solely on RT? Uh, because this is Russian propaganda. propaganda. Well, you don't think the American conservatives consider to be conservative <laughs> propaganda? You don't think truth is considered to be liberal propaganda? Every media outlet is a propaganda outlet. Yeah. So let me tell you this. The fact that I write so many propaganda. outlets of a variety of political leanings might tell you something about the writer. I'm not a propagandist. And if you're going to accuse me of propaganda, then cite the article, cite the data, come forward with the data. Don't sit here and say, because you write for RT, you're a propagandist. I reject that yes. wholeheartedly. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think you were next, it was then, then you. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah, so this is great listening to all these points of view. But I want to recommend... Excuse me, sorry. If you guys really want to check something out crazy that helps give you a bigger part of the picture, study the history of Ukrainians in Canada. Remember, the first Ukrainians that came to Canada, a lot of them were liberals, leftists, even socialists. After World War II, that's when the next wave came. So there's been a war going on in Ukrainian politics, or in Ukrainian Canadian politics for years. And it's a microcosm of everything that's going on right now. And first of all, I want to say thanks to you guys. I've been waiting to see you guys for a long time. I want to always remember this too, Russians and Ukrainians going back hundreds and thousands of years of brothers, so Belarusians, so all, yeah. like the history goes so far and so deep, so basically the point is I'm saying is, study all media, study it all, okay, St like, this propagated from all sides, okay, from Russia, Ukraine, China, all these different countries, all these different medias, so in order to really try to get a bigger point of view, study everything, believe nothing, study everything, and you know, don't, don't let um, all the other crap that's coming out get in the way of it. Like, there's so much crap out there in the air, you know? It's like almost a disease. It's a spiritual disease, if you want to call it that. It's affecting everybody's minds. It's mass psychosis. So one, one way, we're going to die or we're going to change it. And that's the only, there's no other option. Either change or die. Thank that's you. All. Uh, we're going to do one, two, three. All right? And then we'll do questions. But please um, keep it quick because we're all very quick. quick. I actually have a question. Uh, I don't believe that the border fighting was an invasion. Both sides were fighting on the borders from 14 till Russia invaded. And, and you defended a preemptive invasion. But what I'd like you really to talk about is do you really mean that? Because just wars, one of the criteria is that you do not invade preemptively. Right. And if you're invaded, you have the right, certainly maybe we aren't, aren't perfect, but you have the right then to defend your population. That's very, I think that's more important than this UN uh, regulation that you, you point to on preemptive. We don't want injustice, injustice, unjust wars. So the, the just war principle would preclude the invasion of PM by the Russians. That's my position. I'd like to hear your position. Thank you. One, two, and then we'll go. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Scott makes a very convincing point uh, for saying that Russia is acting defensively. Because ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO has been expanding eastwards. And Russia has repeatedly appealed to NATO at conferences and said, we are concerned, please stop this. What did NATO do? They kept putting more arms into neighboring countries, Poland, Romania, etc. Russia even presented draft treaties saying, this is how we think we can maintain peace and security in Europe. NATO ignored it. Russia exhausted all avenues before they took military action. And the tragedy here is that Ukraine signed up to be the pawn, the proxy of US imperialism. They do the fighting on behalf of the U.S. Because who's really at war? U.S. and Russia are at war. But Ukraine is doing the fighting and the killing on behalf of the U.S. That is the tragedy of the Ukrainian war. And the question of who benefits or why is this happening is key, I think. 
you know, of course, the arms manufacturers are benefiting in the short or medium term. But there's also a long-term game that the U.S. is playing. And both Brzezinski as well as Cheney have stated this. The long-term aim is to weaken and eventually carve up Russia into smaller entities that can be better exploited. They use different terms, of course. They use flowery language about liberation and cultural advancement and all that stuff. But the essence is US imperialism aims to carve up Russia to exploit it better. And Russia is one step on the way towards the main rival of US imperialism in its global decline, which is China. The aim of Russia's, or the aim of taking out Russia is one aim in a long game of the US, namely to stop its slow but steady decline as an empire. The rising competition of China, aided by Russia, is a severe threat to the US. And this is why we're seeing this happening. It's not about waging war for the profits of Raytheon. It's for making sure that the US empire can live a little bit longer and the profits can come in a little bit longer. Thank you. I come from the Republic of Georgia, so we have a similar situation that Ukraine is going on through right now. Um, I think it would be very simplistic to blame Putin, quite frankly. Nationalists in Georgia made a lot of mistakes. Those mistakes cost Georgia two territories. Now, you, everybody talks about US, Europe, NATO, this, that. Nobody has helped Georgia to return those territories. It's been over 30 years. It's not going to help you return your territories. Uh, I think you should assign blame where the blame squarely belongs. The Ukrainian government. It is Zelensky that sacrificed Ukrainian people and Ukrainian destruction of its own country. Some, at some point in time, trust me, that revelation will come to you. It will take years. You will understand who caused the devastation to your own country. Somebody asked here, what should we do? Should we give up? Well, let me put it this way. I don't know whether you should give up or not. You can fight, you know, all you want. You've already lost four territories. How much further do you want to go until the full destruction of the country? Perhaps you can sit down and save and salvage something. Uh, and that's my, so to speak, cautionary tale. Я вас очень прошу, немного сел в самокритике, да? Посмотрите, кто на самом деле виноват. В том, что происходит на Украине, вы считаете, что это Путин. Это очень простой подход, неправильный подход. Надо немножко глубже. Uh, it's actually not Putin, it's, it's his other guards around him that are causing this. That is a very, very good point. Not just Putin, but what's more benefit. Why Russia does not join NATO? Listen, you've spoken and before, the nobody end of stopped war. you from speaking, but now you're stopping Make other people. democratic uh, changes and be part you're of the You're stopping other people from speaking. And this is it. Okay. What is Russia your problem? What is your problem? This is the problem. We, we don't have much longer to go. We will do it, and then I'll call on some other people. But let's just uh, I, I see think if Let's set an another meeting with our, our speaking as well. That's right. I think you can organize that meeting anytime you want, okay, and I will not disrupt it. I might come in and ask questions. <laughs> 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 okay, I forget some of the questions, but I will. One of the questions that you asked, what is the Ukrainians to do, or how do you negotiate this? Is some land going to have to be given up? I, I mean, I think, again, it should be negotiated. And by the way, apparently, there was a deal in principle between Russia and Ukraine in March or April, and Boris Johnson went to tell Zelensky not to sign it. The West has done everything to prevent peace here. And again, not to the advantage of the Ukrainian people. But I do think negotiations can settle it. Now, what is to be done with the Donbass, I think should be up to the people of the Donbass. Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of Elon Musk, but again, a broken clock is right twice a day. For those of you who still know what a clock is after cell phones. Um, and he proposed on the Donbass question that you let the republics have UN-monitored referendums on what they want to do. They want to be autonomous, they want to be part of Ukraine, they want to be part of Russia. I think that would be a way to settle it. And again, the Minsk agreements, which Ukraine agreed to, at least had in it 
uh, an allowance for a, uh, a referendum on autonomy. Now, that would be part of within the borders of Ukraine, but in any case, I think that might be a way to settle it. And frankly, you know, the U.S. position on Kosovo was that it recognized the independence of Kosovo even before a referendum. And in circumstances quite uh, like this, so there's some precedence. But in any case, I think that's a matter of negotiations. And what I'm saying, and I think Scott is saying, is look at the fact that Turkey and that Saudi Arabia are willing to host negotiations. They want to help make a deal. And the U.S., <coughs> with all of its clout in the world, has no interest in helping make a deal. Had no interest in the Minsk agreements being abided by. And frankly, had no interest in preventing this conflict. What Russia was asking for before February was reasonable. Don't allow NATO into, or a Ukraine into NATO, and get Ukraine to stop attacking the Donbass. It was pretty simple. And the U.S. was not willing to, uh, to recognize those concerns. I mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. Many people are saying this is the reverse mis uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. What was the Cuban Missile Crisis? The U.S. was willing to go to nuclear war because the Soviet Union was putting missiles in Cuba. The U.S. already has missiles in Europe pointed at Russia. In Poland, for example. And has NATO troops up to the border of Russia. The U.S. would never tolerate that. Can you imagine there being Warsaw Pact troops up to the border of the United States? And could you imagine the government of Mexico City that, that, that Russia maneuvered a coup in Mexico City that brought to power anti-American uh, government that was killing English-speaking people in Mexico? Do you think the U.S. would put up with that for one second? And that's exactly what's happening in the reverse situation here. And the fact that we, again, have not gotten that side of the story and can at, at least not see things from that point of view make it impossible to negotiate a solution, which I think is in the benefit of Ukrainians and Americans. Take the troops off, Ukra off Ukraine and we will negotiate. Okay. Take the troops off Ukraine. Good luck with that. Let me, uh, <laughs> let, let me, let me ask you, a gentleman over here asked a question about, uh, right there, about preemptive war, just war, and that you can't have a just war if you have a preemptive uh, attack. Unfortunately, sir, international law disagrees with you. There's something called the Caroline Affair. It dates back to the 1840s when a U.S. ship was transporting Canadian rebels who the United States is armed, trying to take them into Canada, and the British attacked the ship. And the Americans said, whoa, you're attacking an American ship. And the British cited the need for preemption because of the imminent threat posed by what was on there. It went to the Supreme Court of the United States and so it is, the, it, Caroline is a case that now has guided international law when it comes to preemption. And it has been cited by the United States to justify what happened in, uh, in Serbia, and Russia has indirectly cited it to justify what they did. All I'm saying is that all those sightings are wrong. That's my yeah. so okay, the point. The Ukraine was designed for the war. The Ukraine was designed for the You missed my point, man. My point is that international law justifies preemption citing the Caroline precedent. That's it. Now we come to the issue of what price Ukraine must pay for peace. This is the toughest question of all because it's asking a nation right now to give up territory that belonged to it. Only since Khrushchev gave it to him. Well, it, it, I, again, we can go into history about this, that, and the other thing. That's, that's not what I'm here to talk about. She says, get, get, what, what's that? Ukraine, Russia out of Ukraine. Okay, yeah. now I have a question for you. No, no, ma'am, ma'am, ma ma I'm not debating you on the, the, the efficacy of that. I'm asking you what price you're willing to pay. That's my question. How many Ukrainians need to die? How much Ukrainian territory needs to be captured and annexed by Russia? Because here's the question. Let me tell you what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. Understand that the United States doesn't care about Ukraine, not one iota. Lloyd Austin visited Kiev, then went to Warsaw and gave a speech where he said, we're not asking for a Ukrainian victory, we're asking for Ukrainians 
to kill Russians to weaken Russia. That's Russia the sole no, purpose no, of Putin no, will die. Putin will die. Russia will die. Good luck with that, sir. You go kill Putin. That's your job, not mine. My job is to talk about the role played by the United States of America. The United States of America is funding a conflict which we pretend we want Ukraine to win, but we're not going to let him win. Ask Stalinsky, the man, poor man, flew over here and begged Biden in Congress, give me more weapons. This is after Zeluzhny, his general, said, in order to defeat the Russians, I need 300 tanks, 500 armored fighting vehicles, 500 pieces of artillery, and unlimited ammunition. And we aren't giving them that. We're giving them 50 armored fighting vehicles, no tanks, 18 art artillery pieces. Why are we doing this? To prolong a conflict because that Ukraine, Ukraine is, is going dying to lose. For you. Ma'am, that is why you do not oh, have the Lindsey Bush Graham has said this. The war will go to the last the Ukrainian. War will go to the How Russian many Russian Ukrainians are you willing to sacrifice? The oh, is, and the answer Russian. is. We're not going to want to fight. Hold on. Do not want to fight. Hold on. 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 The war isn't going to end today. Let's hope it ends without destroying the world. Let's hope we can end the meeting without destroying each other. But we have to start in the meeting, even though there are some people that still want to speak, and I'm sorry, but you can't. But let me do say that there are some books of stops in the back. If anybody would like them, they can get them, and he would be willing to do it. He would be willing to sign them. This discussion can continue outside, but it cannot continue in here. This is the beginning of it. I think everybody from their point of view. Let's. Uh,